hello sisters. Uh, welcome uh, to the feminist webinar series. Uh, my name's Caroline. It's really wonderful to see so many sisters coming in and to see you all in the chat as well. Thank you very much. And I'm here with uh, Janet Fraser, who I'll introduce very, very shortly. Um, but before that, to mention today, uh, we're going to be discussing the book uh, Trigger Warning, My Lesbian Feminist Life by Sheila Jeffries. And in fact, it is her autobiography. So it's Trigger Warning, My, My Lesbian Feminist Life by Sheila Jeffries. And this was published in 2020, just a couple of years ago, uh, by the Australian publishing house Spinifex Press. Obviously, this uh, today will be all about Sheila Jeffries and her, the content of her autobiography. But just to give some sense of um, I, things outside of that biography very, very quickly before I go to Janet Fraser, um, is to mention the sheer volume of scholarship and academic publication that Sheila Jeffries has managed to achieve and still is still achieving uh, today over her life. I say scholarship and I say academic, but to be honest, it's extremely accessible, readable, and just fun to read from start to finish, every single one of her books. I'll quickly mention a few just to give a sense of just how significant, obviously, Sheila's, as sisters here already know, Sheila's theorising is. It started with 1985, The Spinster and Her Enemies, Feminism and Sexuality, 1880 to 1930, Five years later, it then uh, Sheila published Anticlimax, A Feminist Perspective on the Sexual Revolution. Then in 1993, The Lesbian Heresy, A Feminist Perspective on the Lesbian Sexual Revolution. And in 1997, uh, The Idea of Prostitution. After that, in 2003, it was Unpacking Queer Politics, A Lesbian Feminist Perspective. 2005, then it was Beauty and Misogyny. Uh, harmful cultural practices in the West. And this book has been translated into Spanish, Korean, other languages. And this year will also be published in Japanese translations. So I'm very excited about that. And then in 2009, The Industrial Vagina, The Political Economy of the Global Sex Trade. And 2012 was another book titled Man's Dominion, Religion and the Eclipse of Women's Rights women's rights in world politics. And in 2014, I know many sisters would have already read this book, Gender Hurts, a Feminist Analysis of the Politics of Transgenderism. And nearly finished now, 2018. And this 2018 book is very connected to the one that we'll discuss today. So this was The Lesbian Revolution, Lesbian Feminism in the UK, 1970 to 1990. And that does bring us up to finally the book that we're discussing today with Janet Fraser, which is uh, the 2020 Trigger Warning, My Lesbian Feminist Life, which is Sheila Jeffrey's autobiography. So going now to Janet and to introduce Janet, I know many sisters will already know Janet from her work with uh, the Australian um, Women's Declaration International Seminar Series on Saturdays. Uh, but Janet Fraser is a mother, poet, historian, and has been national convener of the Australian Home Birth Network, which is called Joyous Birth, since 2004. She writes about feminism, history, human rights, birth and parenting. Her book, which is titled Born Still, A Memoir of Grief, was published in 2020 by the Australian publisher Spinifex Press. So the same year and publisher as the book we'll discuss today. Uh, Janet is on the management committee of the Feminist Legal Clinic and she also co-founded the New South Wales Women's Guild in 2019. So over to you, Janet. Hello, hello everyone. I feel quite awed by such a huge audience. It's much larger than we usually have. I'm honoured to be here and I would really like to introduce Caroline. Caroline Norma was a PhD student between the years 2006 and 2012, supervised by Sheila Jeffries at the University of Melbourne. She first met Sheila when she was 19 years old at a Coalition Against Trafficking in Women Australia group meeting. She now teaches translating and interpreting at a different university in Melbourne, but still contributes to anti-prostitution activism. She was co-author with Melinda tankard reese in 2016 of a book of survivor stories called Prostitution Narratives, published by Spinifex Press. She's been recently involved with the translation of Sheila's 2005 book, Beauty and Misogyny into Japanese, which will be published this year. And um, just to accompany that, Janet, I'll let Janet speak, that's for sure. But we might have a, um, a graphic that uh, depicts my um, long history learning, learning from Sheila Jeffries and um, 
attending dances with her even when I was 20 years old. <laughs> there we go. So, Janet, interrupt you there. Thank you. No, please, go ahead. I love that graphic and we should leave it there. <laughs> That's really excellent. So uh, I thought we should declare our interests, but I think you, I've just done that with your um, autobiography. Um, I don't know Sheila at all, except a little bit from Facebook. Um, and I was honoured and thrilled to be approached to do this webinar. It had never occurred to me that I would be. And uh, when I was asked, you know, what's a Radfern book? I was like, that's the latest one that I read. So um, I suggested that one. I think both of us have some lovely links with Sheila. Yours are much closer, mine are a little more peripheral. Uh, this is a hat trick for Spinifex publishers tonight because we are all Spinifex authors. And my book came out the month before Sheila's. So I was very heavily involved with Spinifex at the time of the launch of Sheila's book, which I attended. Uh, and was absolutely thrilled to be here and discuss this. So would you like to take over, Caroline? Thanks, Janet. Um, I'll start by describing the structure and narrative of trigger warning as, I think, taking a shape that entirely reflects uh, the the, the nature of the politic and the, the methodology of women's liberation that Sheila Jeffries has pursued throughout her career, both in written form and in activism and campaigning. That shape, in my view, is one of um, gradual integration and alignment of every aspect of Sheila's life as time goes along in the book, as the years pass through, and it's written mostly chronologically, we get taken through a process of Sheila Jeffries' um, making decisions or having things happen in her life that lead her, and a lot of it's, it, it's deliberate as, as we'll describe, um, to entirely align her political ideas, her political writing, her campaigning, and her aspects of her personal life and aspects of her paid employment uh, until we sort of reach the zenith towards the end of the book where that's uh, almost wholly achieved. And then, and some of it's a little bit undone towards the end when obviously feminism starts to, to really go into a period of abeyance. And then uh, we get the final chapter at the end. So just, I feel like that's kind of the shape of it. Um, obviously this, Sheila is probably, Sheila Jeffries is unique in her theorising as a radical feminist theorist in the extent to which she does call upon our radical feminist movement to take a form of making the personal so political and to have our lives integrated into the, the campaigning, the movement, each other, um, and even if we can manage it, even our paid employment. And I noticed the other day, a couple of weeks ago with the Chinese Radical Feminist Sisters through the um, Women's Declaration International webinar series, um, she spoke in an interview form with our Chinese sisters and halfway through, I remember Sheila said uh, something to the effect of she felt that the movement as we have it today is very much an action-based campaigning one. And that's good. And the sisters are doing well all around the world in that kind of action-based, approach to our political movement, uh, but that she felt that we didn't spend as much time on this other side of um, liberate, liberating ourselves in terms of our personal conduct, the way we think, um, how we carry ourselves in the world in, in terms of um, rejecting beauty practices. And obviously Sheila's recent experience in South Korea has shown her that actually, you know, we can mount a, a radical feminist movement today, the, the South Korean sisters have done it, whereby you are doing this campaigning and the kinds of movements that we're, the, the kinds of actions that we're doing in the West, but that you can also alongside that incorporate things like take off the course at um, the 4B movement that rejects beauty, uh, uh, yeah, beauty and marriage and children and um, sexuality. So yeah, I kind of was interested in that, that Sheila Jeffries mentioned that fact, uh, but I should move on. So um, the integration, and I'll just I'll just tell the first part of it. Move on and and um, hand things over to Janet. But this in, this idea of um, gradual integration over the years, I think it, Sheila can tell her life in that way because that's kind of how it, how it happened. I, I think it kind of makes sense in the way that it happened that way. So she didn't come to the movement as a lesbian and then become a feminist. It happened in kind of a more of a staged process. But her early life in her family. Um, 
can probably, I mean, Sheila Jeffries was born in 1948, so nothing particularly surprising. She grew up in a relatively con conservative family, uh, but not just conservative, they were a military family, which meant that she moved around with their family to, to Malta and Germany and places in the UK. Um, they're also relig a fairly religious family um, and not one hugely steeped in education um, and sort of intellectual pursuit. Uh, but that changed and she, Sheila Jeffries appears to have had a fairly significant break with that kind of value set in her earlier life, even though certainly there's evidence even from when she was 14 years old being involved in political groups and little campaigns in her school, which was just extraordinary to read. But nonetheless, once she went off to the University of Manchester for her undergraduate degree, she found herself then um, immersed in the values of the sexual revolution and kind of liberal tight left politics. And so sort of this, and she, she describes um, sort of doing things like actions against the Vietnam War and students at the university kind of on a sporadic basis, but really her social circle wasn't fully integrated with that kind of political action, even though political action pops up here and there through that time. Uh, but her reconciliation in herself with the values of the sexual revolution that she sort of moved into with the undergraduate degree uh, was tough uh, for her, as they were for many women, in the impositions of sexuality caused Sheila Jeffries to have to uh, consult psychiatrists and to, to suffer a fairly long episode of depression and to, to get antidepressants for that. Um, and Sheila Jeffries links that kind of difficulty in, in terms of mental distress directly to those impositions of heterosexuality, which made total sense, I think, in the book. Um, and then... Uh, but yes, but, and this keeps coming up in the book as well, her intellect, precociousness, her voracious reading luckily saved her a little bit um, by the end of the undergraduate degree because she was fairly lost, sort of caught up in all the sexual revolution values and ended up sort of pursuing heterosexuality as a, you know, in alignment with those values. And, uh, but luckily uh, did so well in her degree that she was offered a scholarship uh, to, to continue on to a master's degree and it was through that master's degree she went away for a while and worked believe it or not um, I think at an electricity company so responding to client um, complaints and things like that that was very funny uh, but sort of floated around I mean she, Sheila Jeffries was still having a tough time actually um, mentally around that stage as well floated around uh, but then uh, made her way back to Manchester University for the master's degree where she got the scholarship and fortunately, at that point, encountered the suffragettes in her, because she, she was a history major from her undergraduate and into her master's degree, encountered the suffragettes. And it was at that point um, uh, that then, after completing the master's degree, and yes, I, I won't go into the 1970s, I think, yet, Janet, I'll, I'll pause there. I don't want to ruin our um, chronology. Uh, Yes, um, and then began, and I'll talk about this in the next section, I think, but then began to uh, seek out Kate Millett's Sexual Politics, but another feminist book. So it was kind of that link between uh, the suffragists and the contemporary feminist text that led uh, Sheila Jeffries finally away from the values of the sexual revolution and more towards the feminist uh, values. But there was still a, a period there that we need to discuss that was kind of an interim period. But I don't know, Janet, if you want me to discuss that first, well, I'll let you go ahead. I don't mind at all, Caroline. You seem to be uh, powering through it. So why don't you keep going? Sorry, Janet, it's been very kind. Sorry. I think I think Janet um, will talk about the shift to uh, lesbian feminism. So I think I think I need to get this part out, done out of the way first. Sorry, everyone. Okay, so um, now another major thing that stands out reading your autobiography is the extent to which in the 1970s, but also throughout the book, in fact, up until the present day, the intensity of Sheila Jeffries' engagement with political groups. Uh, she founded many groups actually herself, but was also involved in uh, groups throughout the night, almost the whole of the 1970s, um, a directly ground level grassroots and increasingly radical. They weren't always radical. In the beginning, she started out with socialist feminist groups. Um, but the extent of the, at every point in the autobiography, the, the sort of physical or action-based kind of involvement that Sheila Jeffries had, or the things that she did 
then had a very strong effect on the integration of her personal life or herself, other aspects of her life, her paid employment. And she kind of emphasises just how these sort of external things did cause her to reflect on herself and change herself. For example, when she read Kate Millett's Sexual Politics in 1971 while she was teaching at a girls' school, she said, quote, I never uh, felt tempted into such self-abuse again after having read that book. And by self-abuse, she was referring to beauty practices. Um, quote, after two years at the school, this is at the girls' school where she first read uh, Kate Millett, I returned to Manchester to do a one-year teaching certificate. I was already so emboldened by my reading of Kate Millett that I wanted to get involved in feminist politics. So I joined my first feminist group, the women, which was the women's group of the teachers' union, and started to develop my thinking. And yes, to say that uh, Sheila at that point from 1971 onwards got involved in feminist activism and campaigning is really an understatement. Uh, that I tried to count up all of the groups uh, she was involved in or founded and uh, didn't manage to do so, but they included things like the National Abortion Campaign, uh, one of the consciousness raising groups in the area where she was, uh, the London Socialist Feminist Group, Women's Mental Health Group, West London Women and Mental Health Group, and later in the later 1970s, the London Revolutionary Feminist Anti-Pornography Group, the Leeds Rape Crisis Collective, the Leeds Revolutionary Feminist Group, and on top of that, um, archival and history, women's history, lesbian history type groups. We haven't got to the shift and the transition to lesbian feminism yet. Uh, just quickly finishing here, I do want to mention, um, so Sheila Jeffries attended the National Women's Liberation Conference in Edinburgh in 1974, where she said uh, political lesbianism, lesbian feminism, uh, was discussed and put ideas into her head. And then she joined uh, the National Women's Liberation Conference in 1977. So uh, by this stage, she'd been a feminist, but not yet lesbian feminist uh, for a, a number of years. And at these conferences, probably some of us have heard um, Sheila Jeffries talk about the old conference format and style, whereby somebody who wants to give a paper, wants to speak, um, sort of Xeroxed their whole speeches or summaries of them and put them apparently on a table or some kind of lineup for participants in the conference to pick up and just and sort of read and decide which which ones they wanted to go and hear the the writer present out loud. So at the 1977 conference, Sheila writes, my paper for the national conference that revolutionary feminism said that revolutionary feminism was needed for two reasons. One was the fact that the women's liberation movement had experienced a liberal takeover, and the other was the grave lack of theory in the movement. Theory and strategy were needed, I said, to wrest power from the hands of men. So at this stage, Schiller had been involved in socialist feminist groups and had taken the insights, had, had actually had some difficulty with those groups and then attempted to deplatform her and push her out of um, conferences because she was speaking about sexuality and things too radical for them. Uh, but nonetheless, she'd taken on their kind of an understanding of class antagonism, class struggle, and applied those insights to uh, feminism in order to create what Sheila Jeffries called it, calls a new tendency in feminism, and that is revolutionary feminism. So I'll finish up here. It's a little bit of a longish quote, but just quickly to finish up this section of Sheila Jeffries coming to um, the zenith of her feminism, feminism stage. So this is the further description about what happened at that workshop which she presented the revolutionary feminism paper. Quoting now. At the start of the workshop, I was asked to read the paper and my reading was greeted with great enthusiasm. There was some excited discussion and at the end, two women offered to carry me out of the room on their crossed arms, as if I had performed some heroic act. Most of those at the workshop and certainly those who were most enthusiastic were lesbians, whilst star was not. I was wearing what I now call my heterosexual dungarees, that is figure hugging, as in tight figure hugging dungarees. Dungarees were the fashion, but lesbian feminists at the time were wearing ones that were loose and more closely resembled those used by trade persons. Immediately, discussion began amongst many London feminists as to whether a new tendency called revolutionary feminism should be created. I had not intended this since I did not have the political nous or the contacts to make that happen. And I was simply using revolutionary as an adjective. 
But the excited lesbians around me were serious and set out about promoting the idea of revolutionary feminism as a new and dynamic variety of feminism. A meeting was called to iron out the differences, if any, between revolutionary and radical feminism. I did not know much about radical feminism as I had come from socialist feminism, but it did not seem to me to have a clear analysis. I was not sure what the political theory of radical feminism was. So in the very well attended meeting, I asked what it was. Gail Chester responded that radical feminist theory could be summed up in the phrase, our theory is our practice and our practice is our theory and referenced the US radical feminist collection of papers, Feminist Revolution by the group Red Stockings of 1975. I knew the Red Stockings book, but I felt none the wiser. I replied that the practice theory phrase sounded like a Zen koan to me. In other words, deliberately mysterious. I think that was my favorite part of the book. Over to you, Janet. Thank you, Caroline. Um, please feel free to chat and discuss while we do this. Um, I love the title of this book. I loved the book, actually. Um, and I love the title because I think it works on quite a few levels. On the one hand, we're talking about the current um, fad known as cancel culture. So trigger warning because lesbian feminist, so all the people who are terrified of genuine women's liberation will immediately become pale and faint or something. I, I don't know exactly. Um, but also, I think really importantly, what the book talks about is all of those issues that are still triggering in women's groups as well. So these are really dynamic areas that we really haven't got a handle on and there is no one consistent voice about all of these things, whether they're um, class, how we eat, whether or not we become mothers, whether lesbianism is a choice, um, and do we work in coalition with men? Uh, what's the relationship between the women's movement and class-based analysis? And as a, a radical feminist, I think it's really important. Um, but, you know, we marry it, to use a poor term, um, with our uh, understanding of, of women's oppression as well. Um, but one of the reasons that I think this is really valuable for women to read is precisely because of all that triggering stuff. Like you've never seen a women's group explode more quickly than if somebody says, we should all be vegans. And somebody else says, I'm a political lesbian. Then you can have an absolute explosion. In my experience of running a radical feminist group, the one topic that brought us undone was dieting. Uh, because many of us said, well, you know, you can get support for that elsewhere. But in this group, we are actually concerned with much bigger things than seeing that women take up less space in the world. So I think what's really important for women to take away from a book like this is that dynamic evolving sense of women's liberation and both attachment, firm attachment to a clear philosophy, a clear revolutionary sense, tendency, as it were, but also as what used to be more easily described as the right wing, but now is a kind of a corporate capture culture, has taken over so much of the world, I, I think we have to consider the fact that it's okay for us to hold lightly, perhaps, all of those competing notions within the groups that we belong to and within the friendship circles and the women to whom we have strong attachments. I think that so much is at stake for women's lives and girls' lives and children's lives in general at the moment with the spectre of medicalizing, sterilizing, permanently harming and altering the bodies of those who are not conforming to sex stereotypes, that it really should be something that we consider. And not that we all sit around and hold hands and sing kumbaya, I don't mean that at all. But I do mean sharing space with, being respectful of the women who came before us, the women who are here now, the women who will come after us, 
and the widely varying experiences and viewpoints and political theory that these women develop. Sheila Jeffries is obviously one of the great political theorists of the 20th and 21st century. Um, and if she were a bloke, we would think of her as a Noam Chomsky or, you know, equivalent, because people would very broadly be able to see that this is liberation politics at its best. This is deep theorising and then living according to that deeply theorised, deeply felt, deeply synthesised set of standards or morals or ethics, however you think of that stuff. Um, and for me, that was really beautiful, getting to read that journey from um, kind of uh, uh, instinctive activism, which I think a lot of us relate to as, as young people. Young people are often instinctively drawn to uh, the idea of justice and right and wrong, and Sheila is no exception. Um, and then that movement through what was available to activists and people who really cared about social conditions at the time, which was left-wing activism and veering into animal rights activism. And now we're starting to get into the trigger warning areas, right, where we all have to behave. Um, and then eventually being able to move into that women's liberation model of politics and taking all of that experience and all those layers of, of meaning and understanding with us into that. And I relate very strongly to that coming from um, a very strongly lefty family. I've got very early memories of being taken on um, peace marches and left wing things. My parents were in the moratorium marches in Vietnam. I'm exactly 20 years younger than Sheila, so just the next generation. And so I grew up immersed in this kind of stuff. You know, my grandmothers um, struggled against conscription in World War I in Australia. And so I grew up with this background of, of activism. And so for me, I came into women's liberation via that lefty paradigm as well, because that's what there was and it made sense. And then I applied it to women's liberation, which made me the black sheep widow in the family, because who would do that, right? Um, but I think that that pathway possibly no longer exists for women because the left, as we knew it, no longer really exists. The left is also now a loose group of kind of corporate interests that, that class never gets a look in. So it, it was both um, lovely to read and um, sort of, oh, recognition struck me at that time as well. Um, and, and I think that managing all of that tumult that I'm describing is kind of the job of this generation of women's liberation activists that are just coming of age now. We have this amazing, beautiful, rich, deep theoretical history, but also history history. Um, and there is so much opportunity for young, younger women to find a path into radical feminism via that now, as opposed to coming in from the left, because it really no longer exists. You know, I was dabbling on the edges of the Socialist Party when I was very young. That's how I came into radical feminism eventually. So I really feel that managing those differences is something we're going to have to struggle with in order to um, grow the movement. I think that that's going to be one of our tasks. Uh, the movement obviously needs growing at the moment. So I, I think a lot of uh, what Sheila was working on has now become normalised. So a lot of that um, violent sex, that the, the sexualized violence towards women has become normalised and naturalised now. You know, they do it to us and, and think we like it because pornography, the pornographers have won, basically. Um, and those sex role stereotypes are so profoundly embedded now that people literally think that their child should be physically altered in order to, to fit the opposite set of sex role stereotypes. So that's, that's a profound difference and in taking into ourselves of that corporate spun idea that we can chop and change our body parts. So I find Sheila's 
critique of that from early on um, profoundly useful and will never cease to be useful to us if we want to work for women's liberation. And I have to confess, in about 2007, because I looked this up the other day, I said to somebody, I, I do see what Sheila Jeffries is saying about this cross-dressing transvestite kind of movement. I just wonder if, though, we could be kinder. <laughs> so having a good laugh at myself um, now and... Uh, on, on that note, I am thoroughly chastened and I have learned better uh, and my kindness is all reserved for women now. <laughs> so I would like to hand back to you, Caroline. That's, that's a lovely story, Janet. It's nice that you're so honest. Um, you don't have to um, self flagellate at all, not at all. Um, but I think it leads into a nice little point, though, because it is striking um, how early and how concentratedly Sheila Jeffries did pursue the issue of, you know, first calling it whatever it was called at the time, transvestitism, or, and then moving into to the sort of the political um, shape that the, the transgender movement has become now. But she didn't leave it. I mean, even as early as the 2005 Beauty and Misogyny book, uh, that, that has already obviously a substantial discussion in there about the problem. And of course, we can say, yes, Janice Raymond, of course, um, discussed the issue earlier but we don't I, I think I, I got the from the feeling from the book that Sheila towards the end says you know I was left in the wilderness for 10 years I, I was left alone pretty much for 10 years um, withstanding the harassment um, through her, her employment at Mel, Melbourne University um, from trans activists um, threats to be taken to human rights tribunals and things like that uh, because she did pursue the issue so early and continued to do so and even in the book I think she mentioned that even back in the late 1970s she remembers being involved in lesbian and feminist groups where um, men doing woman face and parading as women would come and take up roles I think it, one of them was playing music or something um, and that, that that lesbians at the time if feminists at the time felt uncomfortable about that and, and saw it as a, as a problem um, but that kind of from, again I'm making the same point again but from that kind of discussion I sort of if we do ask why Sheila Jeffries managed to pick up that issue so early and understand that she needed to stick with it well the only ev the evidence that I can see from her autobiography is that she underwent intensive and prolonged involvement with women at the at, at at the most political level, but at the same time, at the most personal level as well, living with women, you know, pursuing her, her life centred on women, but also the intense political activity too, which of course comes with all the fights with women and the difficulties and the, um, so I think, yeah, I, I, mean, I don't want to sort of draw lessons um, from Sheila's autobiography, but I sort of did, it did lead me to think, I must say that if we really do want to be on top of political issues that we need to be on top of as women, and if we do, want to actually do something about them, then this kind of intense political activity where we create, and I know Sheila Jeffries herself has said, has suggested this, that unless we create groups and um, activities, campaigning, this kind of infrastructure, institutions, we've got Spinifex Express, of course, to where young women will come in touch with our movement, then we, we're not necessarily going to get them, um, no matter how, you know, dire the left is and it is dire like you say Janet absolutely um that we're going to miss them they're going to be picked up by other political movements that are going to obviously um lead them down the wrong path so I kind of yeah I mean we're all of course we're all facing the internet now so it's it's sort of a different it's a different age but if nothing else I certainly drew that lesson uh from the autobiography um but to move into, into the chapter just quickly if that's all right Janet um the end of a dream which is um chapter five um after um Sheila Jeffrey's integration into lesbian feminism and the sort of reconciling of all of her almost all aspects of her life by the time she moves to the University of Melbourne teaching in women women and lesbian and gay studies there um and then um Sheila Jeffries reflects upon the political world in the UK that she left in order to migrate to Australia to take up the position at the University of Melbourne. And she, the chapter is called The End of a Dream. And there's two 
um, political problems that Sheila Jeffries sees as having uh, crept into the movement by this stage that um, undermined its foundations. And the first one was uh, sadomasochism, particularly in the kind of queer lesbian form where um, any kind of lesbian feminist event or feminist event or lesbian event um, had uh, lesbians sort of parading with uh, sadomasochistic kind of costumes and um, practices uh, and that obviously frightened women off or um, picked on the most vulnerable women and took them down a bad path. Um, just undermine the foundations of the lesbian feminist movement that was existing in the UK at that time, Sheila says. And then the second one was identity politics. And this is discussed at great uh, length, at much greater length um, in the Lesbian Revolution, Lesbian Feminism in the UK book from 2018. Uh, but just uh, the, the discussion that's given to it in Sheila Jeffrey's autobiography is that particularly with the London Lesbian Archive, um, requirements of um, identities being taken into account in employment of women to staff the archive and to staff the, the, the board and the committees um, ended up causing such difficulty between the archive itself and its government funder uh, that in fact it actually um, was so difficult it endangered the existing committee of which Sheila was a part and um, ended up in some kind of legal action, court action, uh, that really um, ended up spelling the end of any lesbian, -like, lesbian archives in the way that they'd been running it up until that point. Uh, but the bigger point is that at that time uh, in the late 1980s in the, the, the UK lesbian feminist movement, identity politics had a toxic and um, destructive effect. And Sheila describes that um, sort of women having to um, I, you know, preface everything they said with their uh, supposed descriptions of that, their identities, and um, and then, you know, as and we know this politics really well today, and then attempting to bully people and gain ground and aggrandize oneself on the basis of such things. Uh, and she she sees that, but she was analysis is that Thatcherism, which um, sucked out all of the funding out of the women's movement for the Greater London Council at that point, meant that women then uh, turned against each other and became in, into competition each, with each other for resources. And this produced this kind of horizontal violence, awful um, stuff going on. That's her analysis of that. Um, Sheila Jeffries did though, in 1985, uh, go to the United States at Clark University in Massachusetts uh, for a Fulbright for one whole year and linked up with the American feminists. I didn't quite realize before I read Sheila's autobiography, the extent to which Sheila had developed connections, in fact, quite influenced the American feminists by the sounds of it. Um, the attack, the, uh, the liberal attack on feminism, I've got the name slightly wrong, the sexual liberals and their attack on feminism conference that ended up being that famous collection of edited papers that we all have in the libraries today, uh, was actually a suggestion of Sheila Jeffries to name the conference that and to have that as its theme. And obviously that um, was a major uh, point in radical feminist theorising by all the the, the authors, the theorists that we know of, Catherine McKinnon, Andrew Dawkins, etc. cetera. Uh, but then uh, Sheila Jeffries did have uh, extreme trouble getting uh, employment within the UK university system. She certainly did teach a lot across all sorts of colleges, higher education institutions, but an actual uh, university position uh, wasn't offered to her, her, even though she had interviews them, which seemed extraordinary at that time because she was published um, her first book in 1985 and was on the verge of publishing her second book, Anticlimax, in 1990 as well. And that's obviously when the offer from the University of Melbourne came through. So she was busy getting the publicity for Anticlimax sort of done in the UK before moving out there. Um, maybe I'll stop there so I don't impinge upon Janet's discussion from there. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, your um, discussion about the, the SM showing up at women's conferences, um, I, I, it just makes me think of the rallying cry um, that Sheila put in an article after that, that became the afterword of lesbian heresy, 
We can fight back against all the pressures that encourage us to love the boot that will kick us into submission. We can decide not to conduct a romance with our oppressors. We can have a sexuality which is integrated into our politics of resistance and not into our oppression. I found that a very beautiful articulating of, of those concepts. And I wanted to um, go through a bit of a grab bag from the book, um, but also uh, then end up around the discussion of um, corporatization of universities and the like. Um, as I was reading, um, some of the things that jumped out for me were, uh, for instance, the discussion of mental health issues and radical psychiatry and how so much of the women's liberation movement at that time, so the 70s and the 80s, critiqued that whole idea. Um, and it brings to mind Jessica Taylor's work, for instance, her latest book, A Sexy But Psycho, um, and, uh, and, and how in the 50s we're, we're often very comfortable talking about the fact that we now consider women to have been overdrugged, overpacified, um, given um, Valium, for instance, or, or similar, uh, in order to stupefy us um, and stop us fighting back and discovering women's liberation and finding a revolutionary model that allowed us to live fulfilling, enriched lives rather than continuing in that institution of heterosexuality, um, which is a, a really pivotal part of that liberatory part of Sheila's book um, and it's curious to me that so many of us consider the 50s to be the, the heyday of that kind of stuff when women are actually having their puberty prevented and their sexual organs removed um, surgically now and if that's not chemical pacification and the removal of women's capacity to um, find other ways to manage the discomfort of being women I don't know what is. Um, and of course, we also have the problem nowadays with so much therapy having been hijacked by this genderist nonsense that not only is it pacifying for women to move us into concentrating on that very tiny internal sense of self rather than a sense of self held and bolstered, um, supported and enriched by being in company with other women and seeing ourselves in a much wider set of parameters than simply I, this one person. Um, but it's chemically pacifying us in much more profound ways, perhaps, than addiction to those kinds of um, drugs like Valium, as I said, did before. So um, I think this consciousness raising that gets raised in the book uh, is really, really vital and that connection between our personal experience and having the language to be able to describe our oppression. And you see this when you see detransitioning women talk about how they found radical feminism and it all made sense and suddenly they were able to find a critique that depersonalised the pain and made them realise that they weren't faulty, that they were part of a system. Um, and at the moment we have a particularly egregious um, and, uh, it, you know, it's, a, it's looking for prey, the system now, um, in order to sweep women up. And, you know, this is one of my fears about transgenderism, is that it is taking the capacity of the women's movement to function, because lesbians, as is shown so clearly in Sheila's book, have been so vital in the women's liberation movement for so long, for 150 years at least, who knows before then. But at least. And so if you, if you sideline those lesbian women who could be leaders of this movement into pretending they can become men and causing them incredibly difficult, painful, long-term damage to their bodies and their psyche, what does this do? Uh, on the one hand, it might um, cause shortened lives and thus shortened capacity to be part of the revolution. On the other hand, who knows, maybe there's going to be a generation of really enraged young women after this, after they have seen the damage that has been done to them and supported with the kind of ideological capture that, as Sheila says, we've never managed as, as feminists. Which leads me on to um, how much I love the critique of capitalism 
in this book because it's ongoing. Um, and so whether it's um, early stuff around even um, personal details around uh, the East End family um, and the impact of capitalism on those people, um, all the way through to the, the corporatization and neoliberalism that has smashed up academia, as far as I can see, all the way through. So while women's lives are thoroughly dictated by that killer combo of patriarchy and capitalism, we have lost touch with so much of that. Um, and, you know, I, I can't help thinking that part of that is about consumerism. Um, consumerism has become one of the great ways to pacify society. So if you have a group of poor people producing those products, which are then sold across the seas to a group of poor people here who feel like they're getting some sort of consumerist benefit from that, you're selling them the dream. And who's got time for political organising, right? Because you can, you can buy your version of the dream at Kmart, even if you can't buy it at Prada. Um, and I, I think that capitalism is a really pivotal um, analysis and analysis of capitalism is pivotal to women understanding class um, and how we can actually function in the women's movement. Uh, and the, the laughable gaslighting, rewriting of the women's movement as if we had not noticed that women were poor or black or lesbian or had disabilities prior to 2005 when they invented this new thing they called intersectionalism um, it, it is made such nonsense when you read this book and you read about the vast things that women were taking into account and you know having come of age towards the end of that stuff I remember it really clearly as well you know we the women we invited to speak at, at women's events covered a very beautiful and broad tapestry of all women. It wasn't some tiny little niche version of women. Of course, the irony of the, the cancel culture, so-called left um, transgenderists, is that in all of this talk of diversity and inclusion, the only people they do actually accept are those who completely swallow everything about the idea that humans can change sex, which is a pretty narrow band of people really for something that claims to be intersectional um, and inclusive. So, you know, they, they constantly do this topsy-turvy upside down thing with us, which is the gaslighting and the keeping us off balance all the time. Whereas it is so clear that radical feminist theory as developed by Sheila, even though she says she didn't know what that was initially, but her contribution to that theory has been so splendid. Um, it's based in reality. So if women can get access to it, they will actually see that this is talking about their lives. This is not talking about the feelings of men who want to wear a dress and use the women's toilet. It's not about feelings. It's about material reality and what's really happening in your life. And I think that uh, some of those beauty practices that Sheila describes, both in her book solely on that, but also in this book as well, talking about the writing of that book, I, I find that so interesting. I remember back in the early 90s, I wrote a story for one of the um, feminist broadsheets in Sydney that pretty much broke the story of breast implants in Australia. Of course, it you know, sank like a stone and vanished, um, as these things do, women's ephemera. Um, but still, all these years later, we're still hearing about, oh, the dangers of breast implants. Well, this is not a surprise to those of us who've been around for a long time. But I think that personalising of liberation via empowerment, which is a word I've become very allergic to, um, the, the corporations are selling us everything from facial surgeries to reworked vaginas, um, to reworking our feet so that we can fit into their stupid still like shoes and not be able to walk properly or run away, to women altering the very essence of their biology, you know, women having their vulva and their vagina reshaped by surgeons because their views have been formed by pornography. You know, this is a lack of consciousness raising right there in front of us. These women do not have the benefit of radical feminist theory playing out in front of them 
um, so that they can actually discuss that stuff. So, you know, it makes me think of the women who showed each other their services, who helped one another terminate pregnancies rather than doing it in a medical model. Those women, regardless of their sexuality, had a, a, a broader range of vulvas to see, to know what was normal. It was acceptable, you know, and we weren't all so focused on it anyway because it had normal hair on it um, and it was in your clothes. We're, the, we're, we're kind of caught now between this prudish hypersexuality, which creates for the male gaze only, it has nothing to do with women's sexuality. And I do find it prudish. Um, uh, and so women have to be sexually altered to be acceptable. Um, and this, this silly liberal notion that we should say the word vagina very often um, and prove somehow that we are sexually liberated. Um, and I was also really struck by the uh, discussion of Melbourne University kind of bombing um, when it started to work from the idea that selling academia is, is positive, is good, is somehow going to enhance the university. I, I think learning got left way behind at that time. Um, when I caught up with Caroline earlier this week, I told her with some significant horror of having seen recently a television commercial on um, one of our government stations, no less, for a university in Melbourne and the academic teaching the course actually speaking to the camera and flogging this course to us all here in Australia. And I was so gobsmacked. I was so taken aback. Since when is that a thing? I really struggle with the idea that we sell universities online. And I think that as Sheila's experience shows, where women's studies, even gay studies, has been whittled down and whittled down and whittled down to basically nothing and then taken over by the corporate sponsored transgenderism to sell us that in university so that we then become the product. I think that critique of capitalism and showing that whole arc of how universities actually were useful bulwarks at some point against that capitalist push and now they've fallen right into it. And I don't know how we get them back because the hunt now is um, solely for the dollar. So I don't know, well, the pound, I guess, this is a British audience. I don't know how we get them back from that. At some point, will people say, this doesn't really have much intellectual finesse to it. So we need it back. We need theorists like Sheila Jeffries. We need deep thinkers to come through again. Um, but of course, many people can't afford to be deep thinkers because universities get them in and get them out again. So reading about what it's possible to have both in collegiality, in thinking, in um, class discussion, in Sheila's book, I think is another one of those really useful models that we could all uh, learn from. Back to you, Caroline. Great sentiments, I think, Janet, and brings us again back to this seminar series and, and the, the other um, the feminist discussion ones too, run by uh, Women's Declaration International, um, as to what, what this series is achieving, why we're doing it. And maybe that's part of it, that feminist knowledge has been sucked out of the university for all the reasons that you mentioned. And so, again, it's this uh, the insight that we get, I think, from trigger warning about coming together intensely attempting to, sorry, ambulance, um, in, intensely attempting to interact with each other, communicate with each other, pass knowledge between each other, that um, I'll just stop for a minute, sorry. Um, but maybe, yeah, drawing ourselves away from institution, leaning upon institutions and depending upon them maybe in this kind of format is, is the way to go. But then, yeah, again, I think that the message is sort of real life, ground level interaction as intensively as we possibly can so that women come to know each other, come to fall in love with each other, have that as a natural process. I mean, this attempt, I think, that we're particularly seeing online to define what lesbianism is through words and to give it 
uh, a um, articulated definition kind of misses the whole point that when you have this intense political activity amongst women, especially if those women are radicals, that that happens statistically, you just get a higher number of lesbians emerging out of that situation because the the structure of the situation produces it. I mean, anyone that hasn't seen that happen has not been involved in that kind of intense ground level political activity amongst women. And I'm not blaming them for that either. I mean, that's our responsibility to make sure that that's, that exists for young women so that they can just enter into that natural process. I mean, we use, I think the word choice is absolutely right. Um, we should just like, we don't, we don't go into any workplace and not consider that every worker in that workplace um, should be organised in, in a labour union. We might say, sure, it's, it's a difficult task in some contexts and, you know, the, the chances of getting everyone is going to be close to none, but nonetheless, we we never say that we, we don't think they can be organised as union members. And just like we go into any group of women, why, why can't women be organised as lesbian feminists? I think we're selling ourselves a bit short if we think we can't achieve that politically. That's a political goal. Um, and and that's the, I think from trigger warning, we get that understanding that it's a, it's a strategy to liberation. It's a political methodology. Um, so the idea of lesbianism as choice, I think, is absolutely central to that. Um, but I know we're coming close to time, so perhaps I'll let you wrap things up. I think I've talked enough, Janet. Um, your insights have been great. Thanks, Caroline. I, I think you've delved again into rich territory. Um, we, we planned to kind of wrap up by uh, saying, you know, back to the struggle where we are now. Um, and from Australia, we're looking at the UK kind of enviously, actually. <laughs> there seem to be so many more of you. There seem to be, um, well, there are so many more of you statistically, that's a fact. But so then there are going to be more women's liberationists, right? Um, but there are very few of us and we kind of hug the coastline and uh, it is very difficult for us. We haven't had the kind of breakthroughs in uh, public stuff around the genderists that you have had in the UK. Um, so far, they are sticking to the Denton's advice so thoroughly that there is very little really huge overreach in the way that you've had in the UK. So it's harder to start showing that to people. It is starting to happen because um, we, we, we all said quite some years ago, sport will be the thing that brings it home to mainstream Australia. Um, and yes, that's what's happened. So Save Women's Sport Australasia and those women, um, they are doing an absolutely stellar job. Lots of women are doing an absolutely stellar job, but of course we're all completely cut out of the media. So uh, that's a, a, a tricky cross we have to bear and something that we have to struggle against regularly. But now that we are going back to the struggle, we can see the commonalities that we have with our sisters who kicked off that last brilliant wave, perhaps, um, in the 70s. And, you know, even down to the fact that the paedophiles are on the rise and using gay organisations to try and... Um, push their agenda. So uh, we have these really interesting commonalities. We have these other things which we struggle with, which are really different from what our sisters managed. But I think um, our struggle will be much sweeter if we can perform that in concert with women, whether via lesbian feminism or radical feminism or your women's liberation that centres women at all times, including yourself. Um, and I think when you read Trigger Warning, you've kind of got a blueprint for that because that's still possible. All of that is still possible if we choose it, if we know that it's there and we can choose it. And I am grateful to the sisters who came before me and I'm deeply grateful to Sheila for writing the book. Um, and providing us with that blueprint for the future. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Caroline. It's been real. Thanks, Janet. Me too. Um, thanks, Sheila. Thanks, everyone, for attending. See you next week.